I think the big wow for guests or visitors is that when you come into the, the building, it's sort of a tight entry. And then when you come up the steps, there's the big expanse of the full length of the building. And that's usually where we have people go, oh my, you know, there's a gasp or wow, that's amazing. The weird thing is we always get the same question from people and that's where do you live? I think there's this kind of not understanding if you don't have specific rooms and spaces for places, how does that work? What Gary has done to define the space, there are key pieces that help, like the pantry is basically this large red cube that helps separate the dining area from the kitchen. The living room area, there's this gigantic plant that sort of separates it from the kitchen. The only time it feels like too much space is that you're sitting way over there, the doorbell rings, it's FedEx or something, and you're having to try to get down there in time before he just leaves the note. So that time it seems a little bit too, too big. I think when you live in a loft, what's cool if you're a working artist or anybody that works from home, you can have this amazing open live workspace. Lordsville is one of Pittsburgh's 99 neighborhoods, and it's an old industrial area that I like because it's a little gritty. I've been in Lordsville 30 years, so I knew about this building for a long time. Really the first thing that caught my eye with it, it was like, wow, it's a big warehouse building surrounded by houses. Being somebody who's always wanted to live in a loft probably since I was a little kid, it always had this fantasy for me that maybe someday I would uh, be able to have this building and, and live in it. I thought the building was really cool on the outside, but oh my God, the guy had never thrown anything away, probably since 1950. One of the challenges was when we bought it, we had to buy everything as is. There was iron, there was steel, we had a lot of copper, brass, pretty much every kind of metal that you can imagine. So that was some of the prize stuff that we actually found in here. It took us a year and a half to pick through it. It was about an eight month uh, renovation just to get it to the point where we could move in. We worked on it another eight, nine months to really get it to completion. The project had a very tight budget. Almost everything that you see here is repurposed, reused from here in the building or something that we bought used. I like to give new life to old things. You know, I, I think there's a memory to them. You can feel it as a human being that when you're seeing something that isn't necessarily new, that you know it feels comfortable to you. Gary's a very creative designer, and so he repurposed as many of the good things, like the drawers, doors. Everything in the kitchen was here. The island, the countertops, shelving units. Uh, you know, as you go through the whole house, you'll just see repurposed things that we put aside and kept and reincorporated into the design of the place. And then I think you splurge on key things. So the key splurges here were the skylight, the industrial glass doors. And I think if you can kind of do that, it raises the feeling of the whole space. I really daily hit Craigslist to look for specific things. The dining room table is a table from a very high-end law firm in Pittsburgh. Our sofa was for some people that were moving to the neighborhood from Brooklyn and had a smaller space. The uh, fireplace is also one that came out of somebody's camp. I love to cook, so I wanted an industrial stove, and I didn't have you know, thousands of dollars to buy an industrial stove, so I found one from an old church. All of the countertops and the shelving units in the kitchen are all steel, and that was one workbench that was in here that was four feet wide and 22 feet long, one piece of steel, so I chopped it up into shapes that actually work for our uh, counters and our shelving. And the table that's used in the kitchen, that was actually on the first floor of the building. It's built out of an old duck pin bowling lane and then it's a welded steel base to it. The original owner here made it into a workbench and then we hoisted it up to this level and use it, use it as an island, kitchen island. So it's had three lives. To me, it's more fun and interesting to repurpose something that had another life beforehand. One of our key pieces of furniture we have is a, a womb chair in Ottoman by Era Sarnin. And I found it when I was in a Salvation Army. 
It was probably from the 1950s. It, it had just faded. I knew that it was something really special. I just didn't know who had designed it. And the guy goes, well, it's $45 and you have to take that weird Ottoman thing with it. So, but I was like, oh, jackpot, this is cool. We had it recovered in similar fabric that it originally was yellow and we, we kept it yellow. One of the great finds in the property was this teak and Gary was able to use it as a design feature in several parts of our home. When you first come in, there's a wall that features the teak. Gary created and designed a teak platform outside the bathtub so that you're not just stepping down onto concrete floor. He created a hanging shelving unit using the teak in the library area, and then also it helps with the seating out on the deck. And we'd always talk that it'd be great to be able to have dinner parties outside there and have a big table. Um, so I wanted a, a travertine or marble table. Oh God, that heavy table, yeah. Gary found this great marble table on Craigslist. And um, one of the things that I found out, you can find something that's amazing, but then getting it to your place is another thing. And so we get there and it just weighs a ton. It took four people to get it in and then I thought the two of us would be able to haul it up the staircase ourselves, but it made it about halfway and had to sit there for two or three days until we got somebody else to come help us get it the rest of the way into the house. One of the things that we found that was really cool was this vintage vinyl tile from the 1950s, and it was still in its original container sealed. And we were able to use that. It's this cool black tile that has little flecks of color and stuff in it, which is great because it doesn't show dirt. <laughs> we had to think outside the box to design the bathroom. You know, how do you create a, a space within the space? Uh, so what I ended up doing was designing a pavilion that's a, really a building within the building. In our bathroom, lots of the pieces that were found in the building were actually incorporated. Because we had so much sheet stainless steel, Gary surrounded the whole bath shower area with stainless steel. I didn't want it to be a dark space, so I managed to get a salvaged glass door, an old storefront door, which is a glass door with metal chicken wire incorporated into it, which we have in some of the other doors that was already here in the building. So it was a nice fit but rather than using it as a door, it's turned sideways, you know, so it's really a window and then it's frosted. So you, you can see a few shadows when people are in the bathroom, but you know, you can't really look in. When we first came into the building, a lot of what was on the floor was gnarly shag carpet from the 70s that had all kinds of stuff in it and old linoleum tile. And that was all just taken up. We liked the blemishes and the things that were happening on the concrete, so we just sealed it as is and thinks it's really cool. The second floor, uh, the main living space is actually hickory flooring that was also salvaged in 1952 from an old steel mill that was uh, from Wheeling Pittsburgh Steel. One of the things that's really appealing about having the whole building is that in the city, especially you're, when you're in a neighborhood where there are row houses, a lot of times you're only getting direct light coming in twice a day. But when you have the whole building, it's really amazing to be here all day and different parts of the loft and studio are illuminated by light. There were a lot of design changes that were made from the very first to where we ended up with simply by just being in this space and be able to say, wow, isn't that really cool in the springtime how the light comes through the back window and it hits that wall in this way, or the evening light comes through the studio and how that reflects onto Atticus's work. My favorite room is my studio. One of the things I love about the studio is that the staircase is very sculptural. So it's kind of like creating and living in a place that's uh, like an exhibition space. The space is purposefully left raw and rough. It feels kind of like a barn to me. We have a similar aesthetic. We like things to be kind of clean and open and bright. And everything's white, so the floor's white, the wall's white, the ceiling's white, so you get light bouncing everywhere, and then you have this really strong vertical sculptural staircase that comes up through the middle of it. It's been really cool to see how the space affects the size, at least, of what I make. I had always lived in a, a much smaller space, so my work was very small. A lot of it you could just hold in your hand. And then we moved into this space, and now my work has just gotten bigger. 
we were thinking about just having a cool place to live, but we never really thought about how the space and what we actually do as artists kind of intertwine and becomes really part of you know our brand. I think that when people will come into the loft, they'll often comment, wow, I've been to a loft space, but they were always so cold, and yours isn't cold. And I, I, I always think that it, it really has to do with the fact that there are these interesting pieces you know, throughout the space. They have stories around them, and so people connect to them, and so that helps you connect to the space and makes you comfortable in it.